everyone, this is Anna, and we are going to be starting off with uh, our chapter on histology now. And this particular video is the very first one in the series, and so it's part one. And we're going to introduce basic tissues, uh, some of the ideas behind what epithelial tissue is, and then go over the different types of simple epitheliums. So let's move on. Okay, so let's talk about our basic tissue types. We have four very basic tissue types in the body. You have epithelium, you have connective, muscular, and nervous. Okay, the epithelial tissues are going to be lining covering, secreting, they're those types of tissues. Whereas connective tissues tend to be in places where you need some supportive structure to keep something else alive or to keep it firm or to keep it in the right shape, all right? Muscular tissues, their main idea is they contract, they cause movement to so they're all about movement, okay? Whereas nervous tissue is about integration and control, okay? Now, I want you to notice what I've done up here where I've got basic tissue types. These are overarching broad categories. And I might occasionally ask questions on tests where it's like, what type of, what is, of, of the basic tissue types, which one is this? And you would say epithelium or connective or muscle. Most of the time, we're actually gonna be digging in, digging in deeper and we're gonna be wanting to know what specific tissue type something is. So if I'm asking for something like specific tissue type, you're not gonna say, oh, well, that's just epithelium. You would say something like that is simple squamous or simple cuboidal or simple columnar epith um, epithelium, okay? Or that is hyaline cartilage, or bone, or something more specific, okay? So be, be cognizant, be aware of the language when people are asking you about what is the basic tissue type you're looking at versus what is the specific tissue type that they're wanting to know about, okay? Let's look at the next slide. All right, so there's a whole lot of information. There's whole classes on embryology, like an entire semester on just embryology. We're gonna do embryology in under two minutes, I hope. What do I want you to know? I want you to know that the lump of cells that begins to differentiate to create the embryo is going to form three, whoops, three primary germ layers. In this picture right here, you can see the layers. We've got one being colored yellow, we've got pink, and we've got blue. And you can see the yellow is the endoderm, mesoderm, and then blue is the ectoderm, okay? What do I want you to remember for testing? I want you to remember that there are three primary germ layers in the embryo, and that each one of these germ layers is gonna differentiate into different tissue types. The ectoderm will become epidermis and nervous, 
mesoderm will become endothelium, mesothelium, muscle connective. Endoderm is going to give rise to a lot of the tissues of the mucosae. That's basically what I want you to know on this particular topic. I've got another little slide on the next page, and we're going to look at that one, but you're not going to need to memorize most of it. All right, so on this slide, no, you don't need to memorize it. I'm trying to give people background information so that you can visualize what is going on. So over here, we've got our uterus, and over here is the ovary, and here is the ovulated egg, and you can see there is where it's fertilized, and then it finishes meiosis two, and now you can see you've got two sets of, you've got the my, mitosis going on right here, so that you're going to start getting um, two cells. Then you're going to get the clump of cells, and then the clumps of cells are going to begin to differentiate into germ layers. So over here on this picture, you can see that it's differentiating into the three germ layers. They've got them labeled all here, and then as, oops, sorry, and then this is dates. I should have gone the other way around. So day zero is right here. And then you can see that it begins to get more and more complex. And now we're starting to see the three germ layers. And then you can see very clearly the germ layers here. Okay, I hope that wasn't too confusing. But I'm just trying to give you kind of a, a visual or a feel for what it's gonna be looking like as it differentiates into the germ layers. And that is all we're going to learn about the embryology on this particular topic. All right, let's look at the characteristics of epithelial tissues. So this particular slide has some notes on it. And you want to mem remember things like they're closely packed, uniform shaped cells. Avascular is very important. That basically means no blood vessels. And that's important because of its relationship with connective tissue. Connective tissue always is next to the epithelial. And I'm gonna abbreviate it CTP for connective tissue proper. So because there's no blood vessels, there's no oxygen or nutrients directly in the epithelial, so things must diffuse from the connective tissues. We've also got special junctions that we're gonna look at in just a minute. Um, those should be reviewed from your general biology. So let's just do a quickie look at this picture. So remember, maybe from general biology, you learned about the lumens of a tube, all right? So there'd be some kind of liquid or fluid moving through this area. This is going to be the epithelial tissue. And what you can see is you've got cells that are closely packed together and they are about the same size and shape, okay? So that is a key characteristic. Now, how do we get these things packed in and staying close to each other and staying connected? Well, a lot of that has to do with the special types of junctions. So let's look at the next slide because we've got a drawing of that. All right, right here on this particular picture, we have a single epithelial cell right here, and we've got another epithelial cell right here, and you can see they're the same shape and size. We have our basement membrane, so basement, kind of like the basement of a house, it's on the bottom. And then we have the apical surface, which is gonna be the surface away. And then this whole area would be the lumen of your tube where you have stuff moving along it. Now, how do we keep these cells close together? Well, first of all, we've got something called tight junctions. And I think of these as snaps. They snap together the two cells, okay? Then you've got desmosomes. And I think of desmosomes as shoelaces. So you can see you've got these long strands, so like right here, and then the strands go through here and you're basically tying them together. And then you've got gap junctions, which are tunnels. Now gap junctions are about moving things from one cell to the next. Now it needs to be super tiny, okay? So gap junctions don't help hold them together. It just lets things to go through like charged ions, like, um, like sodium ions, okay? So the two things that really help tie to keep these cells from coming apart are going to be the gap jun excuse me the tight junctions and the desmosome desmosomes tight junctions 
really kind of create a tight, closely adhering surfaces so that things can't really go between them. But if you think about a shirt, if the buttons are all snaps and you pull on it, that shirt's gonna pop open pretty darn easy. But if you think of a shirt where, so say, let's think of corsets. Some corsets have ties on them and you tie the sides of the shirt together, it's gonna be really hard to pull that apart without undoing the laces. So the desmosomes really are the powerhouse for preventing tearing, whereas tight junctions are really the powerhouse for preventing things from passing between the cells. Okay, let's look at another slide. All right, let's talk about some more characteristics of epithelial cells. So they regenerate. Why am I having right there? Regenerate fast, all right? They can reproduce, they can do mitosis quickly and replace themselves. This goes along with them being uniform in size and shape. So they are heavily mitotic and they are roughly uniform in size and shape, okay? They also, remember, are closely packed together so that one epithelial cell is always touching another epithelial cells. When they stop doing that and they start floating around in the body, then you change what type of cell that is and we now call it a cancer, okay? So they need to be co closely packed in together. Right, they are also what we call polarized cells or polarized tissues. So basically that means when you look at the cell, so we're gonna draw a columnar cell, you will have an apical surface and you will have a basal surface and they are polarized, okay? One side is gonna be exposed to the environment and the other side is gonna be stuck to connective tissue proper, okay? All right, let's, um, let's actually look at another picture. All right, so we already know my hand drawings aren't that awesome. So we're gonna look at this picture, and again, we've got the outline of a columnar cell right here. This is going to be where you find the apical surface, all right? The apical surface is often often also called the free edge. Now these can be smooth or they can have little folds in them and we call these folds microphylli or they can be ciliated where you've got movement along the surface, okay? You do need to know the difference between cilia and microphylli. Okay, now down at the other end, we have the basal area or the basement membrane, okay? Now in between this, and you can't really see it, but in between here, there's some stuff called basal lamina, which is this gluey substance that is sticking things together. You will also have, and it's not being shown here, little reticular fibers coming out of the connective tissue that basically there are receptors on the basement membrane that hook onto these collagen fibers and that helps anchor the epithelial cell to the connective tissue proper that technically would be all down here, okay? All right, so now that we have the basic shape of the cell and the basic structure, you've got the apical, but this is the basal, let's talk about how we organize the, the types of epithelial cells you have. So we're gonna talk about cells in terms of how many rows they have versus their overall shape, okay? Now, if we look here, we've got the word simple, that means there is one row, and stratified, which means there's two plus rows, all right? The shapes are squamous, so they are flat, or cuboidal, which is cube-shaped, columnar, which is basically a column or rectangle, okay? 
Now we can look at these and you can see one row of a very flat shell cell, one row of a cube shell cell, and then one row of a columnar cell. Now the stratifieds are a little bit trickier in that if we look at these right here versus here, this is the basal area, this is the apical area. You will notice that the basal, they're cuboidal. The apical, they're squamous in shape. So the name for these comes from the apical surface. So the functional surface. So this gives rise to the name, so that is stratified squamous. Over here, I've got a cuboidal cell and a cuboidal cell. Same thing, the name comes from the apical surface, so this is stratified cuboidal. And then over here, the apical cells are columnar in shape, so this is stratified cuboidal. So then your next question is, is well, why are these all cube-shaped? They are all cube-shaped because they are the mitotic cells that are going to be making new cells that then get pushed up towards the apical surface. And then it just keeps going on and on and on. Okay? All right, let me kind of reduce this down a little bit more to create some more writing space while we still keep our pictures. Okay, so we're going to discuss cells in terms of their arrangement and number. Okay? So let's kind of think about what they do. So with simples, you are going to be functionally doing things like absorption, secretion, filtration, osmosis, diffusion, stuff like that. With the stratified cells, why have them be stratified? Well, there's two reasons to have things stratified. The first one is you're in an area where the apical cells are being damaged. So they're in high risk areas. So they get scratched off or they get burned by chemicals. So you need to be able to constantly be replacing them. So you have multiple layers so that you can constantly replace the apical cells. Okay, so that's one reason to have stratified cells. Now there are some areas where we have stratified cells that aren't being damaged. So the reason you have more, more cells there is you can make, you can increase the quantity of stuff being made. So, for example, in the ovary, we will use stratified cuboidal cells in places where we want to make lots and lots of estrogen hormone. Okay? So it's not a place where you're going to be damaging the cells, but you do need to be making a lot of them. All right. Now, before we go on more, let's talk about cilia versus microphylli. You've absolutely got to know the difference between these. So first we've got structure. All right. Cilia is made from microtubules that push through and form long strands that stick out. Whereas microphylli are folds in the plasma membrane. So structurally, very, very different. Cilia can move, microphylli cannot move. Function is the next major difference. All right, cilia move stuff. They move stuff along the surface. So they might be moving an ovulated egg, or they might be moving mucus down the back of your throat, okay? the back of your nasal cavity. Microphylli, because you take a cell, so let's say 
we normally have a cell like this. But I'm going to take a cell that's kind of like this. And that looks really stupid and it doesn't fit well with other cells. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold like a paper fan. So as you when you were kids, you probably folded paper fans. All right? So that now I've got a cell that's like this. So the this apical surface has been folded into a fan. So I have a whole lot of surface area here that has been packed into a tiny space. So what functionally microphili do is they increase surface area. If you do not have that memorized from GenBio, you need to memorize it now, okay? Now the reason I'm bringing this up is because we're gonna start talking about these simple types of epithelium. And sometimes we throw in the word ciliated simple columnar epithelium. Not all simple columnar epitheliums are ciliated. Sometimes they are, okay? So you need to be aware of that. All right, let's start looking at pictures of these. All right, here we're looking at simple squamous epithelium. So simple is telling you one row of cells. Squamous is telling you that the cells are thin and flat. So if we look at this picture, one row of thin, flat cells, okay? So where do you find them? You're going to find them in places where you need the tissue to be thin for diffusion and osmosis. So you've got capillaries, the alveoli of the lungs, those kinds of areas. So you can see an example right here, which is a blood capillary, okay? Let me make this a little bit smaller and then let's take some notes, okay? So, functions, 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 function, functions. So actually, let's erase that. What do I need you to know about each type of tissue? I need you to know its name. I need you to visually recognize what type of tissue it is. I need you to be able to give me an example of where you would find it in the body. And I also need you to tell me the function of that tissue. Now I've got certain words that I never ever want to see you using on a test or quiz. So protect is one of those words. Actually, this is two words. Provides structure or support. I don't want to see you putting those, ever. So we're going to take these, we're going to put a big X through them. The reason I don't want you to put those is because everything in the body is protecting something. Everything in the body is providing support for something. It's a non-answer. It is too generic, too vague. I want you to specifically explain what things are doing, okay? So what does uh, simple squamous epithelium do that's special? Why would you want to use simple squamous epithelium? So the whole point of studying histology is to see how the shape of tissues goes with the function of that tissue. They're, they're hand in hand, okay? So what are your, its features? Well, it's very thin and very slick because of the way the cells are overlapping each other this way. All right, they're not bumpy. There's no cilia. There's no microphylli, okay? So very thin. So very thin, very slick. So this means you have easy, fast transport. Through the cell. Things move through all cells. So saying that the cell can do 
transport or it can do diffusion or osmosis doesn't distinguish that cell from any other type of cell because all epithelial cells can do that. So what's special is that because it's so thin, things can move much faster and more easily through the cell. So I want you to think of a doorway. All right, so you've got a doorway and it's instead of having a door, it's got little strings of beads hanging down. It's very pretty, okay? And you can just pass right through it. There's no blocking your way to get through it. So simple squamous is kind of like that. It's a doorway. There's a visual barrier, but it really doesn't stop anybody from going through it, okay? So don't confuse this with absorption and secretion. The way we're going to use those terms with simple cuboidal and columnar epithelium is different than what we're talking about here with easy, fast transport. Okay, now let's talk about the slick thing. I want you to visualize a fish in the water. And fish have scales. And those scales are smooth so that when the fish moves through the water, it doesn't have a lot of drag. Simple squamous cells, when you look at them, don't they kind of look like fish scales? All right, that means they are very smooth and slippery. Things can move by them very easily, okay? It also means things don't stick which is important. And the reason it's important is like, let's look at this function versus this function. All blood vessels are lined with simple squamous epithelium, including in the aorta. But the aorta is very, very thick, which means you're not gonna be supporting the tissues with oxygen by things going from the aorta's blood into the adjacent tissues It can't get through. So the aorta is lined with simple squamous epithelium because things don't stick. You do not want platelets and clots sticking. So line it with simple squamous epithelium. But in capillaries, they're lined with simple squamous epithelium because this tissue is so thin that gases can get in and out very, very easily, okay? So some general ideas to keep in mind. Okay, one, it's one of the thinnest tissues that you're gonna find in the body, okay? Two, easy transport. And this is especially true and important in lungs and capillaries. Okay, and in other areas. Now, I'm gonna use a word and I don't want you to get bogged down on it, but things move in and out. So that means you can secrete watery fluids easily and quickly. So for example, serous fluid is gonna come through the simple squamous epithelium because it can just pass from the plasma of the blood directly into the, um, the, the space between the parietal and visceral peritoneum or whatever you've got, okay, or pleura. All right, we've got two special definitions that I just want to quickly remind people about so that you don't get confused when you see them later in AMP1 or 2. Endothelium is simple squamous epithelium, but it's only found lining blood vessels, the inside of the heart, and lymphatic vessels. So remember, this is A and P, and we like to have multiple names for the same things. Sometimes they're straight up synonyms, and sometimes they convey more information. So with this one word, we communicate that it's simple squamous epithelium and that it's located in one of those places, okay? Now mesothelium is when we're dealing with simple squamous epithelium, but it's in serous membranes. 
So again, we communicate both the type of epithelium and the location with this one word, which is kind of cool when you think about it. All right, let's go and look at some different pictures of simple squamous epithelium. All right, so we're gonna start off with the one picture that's the least helpful, and that's this picture right here. This is a cheek swab. Technically, this was stratified squamous epithelium, but we're gonna go with it and not worry about that because what I want you to notice is the way it's captured single epithelial cells and put them on the slide so that you kind of get an appreciation of what the top-down view of the cell is. So remember, that's looking top-down. If you looked at it from the side, it would just look like this. It doesn't really look like much. However, this is what we see in most of the body. So if we come over here, whoops, and we look at this picture, what you see is you've got the lumen of the tube right there, and then I've got a dark line and then I've got slightly lighter colored lines right here, okay? So these dark things right here are nuclei, and then you kind of have to use your imagination that the rest of the cell is located right there and that it's kind of covering the blue of the nucleus. This is your typical Simple squamous epithelium. This is the view that we are usually looking at when we're observing simple squamous epithelium. All right, so over here we're looking, so this is um, the glomerulus of a kidney. And again, we've got the lumen of the tube right there. And then you can see the nuclei right here. And then you can use your imagination and you can see that you've got the rest of the simple squamous cell right there. So it is very thin and flat. And in fact, a lot of times what we are really seeing isn't necessarily the cell, but the pookiness of the nucleus is what we really usually are focusing on when we're looking at that simple squamous epithelium. Okay, all right, let's move on to the next tissue type. All right, simple cuboidal epithelium is a cube shape, so simple one row, cube shaped cell, which we're seeing right here. Where are you going to find it? In tubes, ducts, secretory cells. What do I want you to memorize about function, absorption and secretion? Okay, so when we were looking at simple squamous cells, they're more like this in shape with a little bit of nucleus. And what you can do is you can compare, and in fact, let's do it by size. Let's, um, so that would be a simple squamous cell, all right, compared, if we're comparing these two right here, okay? Let me erase that. All right, so if we compare them, if this was a simple squamous cell, it would be like that. So what you will notice is that with the cuboidal cell, there's lots of space inside the cell, which means there's lots of organelles and there's lots of cytoplasm. But in the simple squamous cell that I've kind of drawn sort of maybe right there, not a lot of space, not a lot of organelles, not a lot of cytoplasm. So what do you find in the cells? Well, the organelles, are the things that are gonna be making things. So ribosomes, Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, cytoplasm contains the resources, the proteins, the lipids, the doodads you need to make stuff. A cuboidal cell has the space and resources to be a maker factory. Simple squamous doesn't, it has no room. It is a pass through. Okay, um, it would be kind of like if you were walking through a vending machine versus walking through a giant restaurant, okay? So because cuboidal cells can either make, bring things in and make things, they can absorb things, alter them, and then secrete things. So they do absorption and secretion, whereas 
Simple squamous is a pass-through entity, okay? So the structure of the cell determines the function of the cell. All right, look at, let's look at some more pictures of these. All right, here we have two different types of glands with simple cuboidal epithelium. So you see one row, and then you've got roughly, well, those are less cuboidal, but these are pretty cuboidal, okay? Down here, very cuboidal in shape, simple cuboidal. They've got all this room in here for making stuff that is then going to be secreted into the lumen of the tube. All right, next slide. All right, this first slide over here should look really familiar because we just looked at it with simple squamous epithelium. So right here, we have simple squamous epithelium, and this is the lumen of the tube. This is from a kidney, and the reason I'm using this picture is because the kidney is an ex excellent example of both simple squamous epithelium plus simple cuboidal epithelium. And what I want to emphasize is that usually you don't have just one type of tissue. You have two plus tissue types. You have multiple tissue types all in one picture. So you need to be able to recognize the different tissue types. So with epithelial cells, I'm gonna ask myself some questions. The first question I'm gonna ask is, is there a free edge? If there is a free edge, it's epithelium. So I've got a lumen, I've got a free edge, it's epithelium. Now right here, there is a lumen, there is a lumen, there is a lumen. So there is a free edge. So I know that this is epithelium. Then the next question I was, I'm gonna ask myself is the number of rows that are present. Is it one row or two plus rows? Well, if I look right here, I see one row of cells. So I know it is simple epithelium. And then the next thing I'm gonna ask is the shape of the cells. Are they flat, so squamous? Are they cube or are they columnar? Well, these are cubes, so it is simple cuboidal. Over here, I have a free edge, one row of cells, and they are flat, so it is simple squamous. Over here, I have one row of cells. I have a free edge. I have one row of cells, and they are cube-shaped, so it is simple cuboidal. Now, to your upper right, I've taken a picture of one of these tubules and I've put it at much higher magnification. So right here, you see the lumen of the tube, so you know you've got a free edge. And then I see one row of cells and I can see the shape of the cell roughly. So some of them are easier to see than others. All right, so that is simple cuboidal epithelium. All right, let's look at simple columnar. All right, simple columnar. One row of cells, columnar and shaped. Where do you find them? Well, the non-ciliated are found in places like the GI tract. Ciliated simple columnar tends to be found in the respiratory and genital urinary tracts. Now, remember with Cuboidal, I talked about how much space there was inside so that it was a factory. Simple columnar is also a factory, but it is a gigantic factory. So it also does absorption and secretion just like simple cuboidal epithelium, okay? If cilia is present, then it can also move stuff. It is very common to have either microphylli or cilia present on simple columnar epithelium, but it is not ubiquitous. Simple cuboidal often will also be have microphylli or cilia within the body. So be watching for that as you're reading about the different types of tissues. All right, let's look at a nice classic example of simple columnar epithelium. So I have here a lumen, I have here a lumen, 
So this is a free edge. So my first question is, is there a free edge? Yes. Then this is epithelium. Is there a free edge up here? Yes. So this is epithelium. Right here, is there a free edge? No. So the primary tissue type is most likely going to be connective tissues, okay? And we'll learn more about covering membranes later, but this happens to be a covering membrane, which means I happen to know that the other name for this that we will use is lamina propria, and lamina propria is a realer connective tissue proper in mucosa. So that's just a preview of information that we're going to be going over later in this unit. All right, so the first question was free edge. Second question is number of rows. Well, one row, it's simple. Now I'm gonna look at the shape. It is columnar, so I have simple columnar epithelium. Now it's difficult to see, but in some areas you can see this little hazy film, all right? That is cilia, so it is ciliated simple columnar epithelium okay all right let's look at another picture so in this picture we're again looking at simple columnar epithelium it's not ciliated doesn't have microphylli but it has something else special it has the goblet cell the word goblet comes from a cup like a wine glass that's shaped like that. And you can see that that roughly kind of looks like a goblet. Goblet cells make and secrete mucus, okay? It is common to find simple columnar epithelium with goblet cells present. Sometimes the columnar epithelium is also ciliated, but not always. All right, let's look at a nice photomicrograph of this. All right, this photomicrograph is at 1,000 magnification, so it's very high. So I have a lumen here. I have a lumen here. It is difficult to, because of the way the magnification and the way this is cut, it's difficult to see what type of epithelium this is. I wouldn't necessarily expect you to be able to tell me, but I happen to know, because I know what slide this is, that it's simple columnar and also that it's ciliated, simple columnar. But the reason I'm using this picture, and actually, before I go on, the re if you look over here, it's a little bit easier to see the simple columnar structure. And here you can see the cilia, okay? But to the point, the reason I put this in here was because of the goblet cells, which show up very nicely. Because they are filled with mucus, they stain a lighter color than the rest of the epithelium. This particular one right here is nice because you can see how it is opening up to the surface. Okay, is where some of the others are cut at an angle and you don't see that. All right, let's look at the ciliated version drawing of this. All right, this picture is more of a drawing of the photomicrograph on the previous page so that you can see clearly the simple columnar epithelium with the cilia. And now you can see nicely the shape of that goblet cell and how that comes up to the surface. Okay. All right, let's move on to the weirdo of the simple epithelium types. All right pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Let's break that down. So this prefix right here means false. So this is falsely stratified columnar epithelium, which means it's not truly stratified. It's a false stratified, so it looks stratified, but it is a simple epithelium. And if you took these cells and you found their basement membranes, you would find that every single one of them 
attaches to the basement membrane. So what you had originally was a row of simple columnar epithelium like this. Then something happened and you put force here and you put force here and you squished them together. And when you did that, some of the cytoplasm went this way, some of it went this way, so that now you've got cells that are kind of like this. But they all touch the basement membrane. Okay? So one of the telltale signs is the nuclei. Nuclei in columnar epithelium is in a nice, tidy row, whether it is simple columnar or stratified columnar. But if you look here, you will see that with the way the cells have been squished, I've got nuclei at all different heights. <clears throat> and then in this case, we've got cilia. Now, if there is no cilia present, we call it pseudostratified columnar epithelium, or PCE. If there is cilia present, we call it PCCE for pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. This is one of my favorite pictures, or photomicrographs, and you can see the basement membrane here. And then you can see how the nuclei are all a jumbled mess. It looks like somebody took a bunch of marbles and just threw them all down, okay? And then you can see the cilia up here. All right, let's look at another photo micro of this. This one, this particular picture comes from trachea. And right here, we'll look at this later. Um, we do cartilage. Uh, connective tissues. This is hyaline cartilage. Now here I have simple columnar epithelium and it's a little difficult to see on this picture but these are my nuclei that I'm trying to color in and you can see that they're kind of jumbled up but I still have some nice big fat goblet cells and I've got some nice cilia in here. Um, all right, so that's that particular picture. What's on the next slide? All right, here's another picture of pseudostratified. And again, what you're noticing is that the nuclei are not evenly lined up. I've got a nice big fat goblet cell in here and I can see the cilia, okay? All right. So we're going to stop there with part one, and we'll go on to part two and talk about the stratified epitheliums.